Okay, so today we're gonna continue our discussion of renormalized perturbation theory. I'm recording. Yes, okay. Oh, you don't see the screen. Whoops, that is a problem. Let me just pause this then. Okay, so uh, today we're gonna continue our discussion on all perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, actually, let me start first by asking if there are any questions from the last lecture. I'll review the last lecture quickly, but if there are any questions that are uh, important right now, let's ask them. Or you could ask them as I uh, go through the review. All right, so what did we do in lecture two? Um, in lecture two, we said we introduced next to Poincare symmetry. So the, in the first part of the course, we talked about uh, Poincare invariant quantum field theory in um, uh, these space time dimensions. And we talked about uh, Poincare transformations, x going to lambda mu nu. These were Lorentz transformations, and these are translations. Now, we, we introduced a new transformation called scaling, which is so in the case that we're is of interest in relativistic theories. You're you're scaling all x all, all x mu with by the same amount, and then we said uh, if the theory is relativistic, you have Poincaré and the scaling. It's natural to postulate another symmetry, another uh, this theory to be symmetric and under another transformation, which is special conformal transformation. So the intuition behind special conformal transformation was that um, you do inversion. You send x mu to minus x mu over x squared, right? And then translate and invert back. This whole thing, the group generated by uh, the group generated by uh, scaling Poincaré transformation and special conformal transformation is called the conformal group. In uh, Lorentzian space time, R d minus one comma one, this group is S O d comma two. You recall that from the last uh, course. Um, and in Euclidean space, so R R D, this is S O D plus one comma one, which is the Lorentz group in two extra dimensions. Yeah. And what is the pattern in general? Like, is they are adding like one on the D minus one side and one on the one side? They are adding the they are adding one extra dimension in each, like one one extra space dimension, one extra time dimension. Is that, is that, is that or... No, this is it. this is this is it basically. So you you we have it's we had the Poincaré transformations that was related to conformal transformation. So conformal transformation, a lower dimensional thing, is like Poincaré transformation in a higher dimensions. Oh, you're asking if you make take that higher dimensional theory and make it Poincaré invar uh, conformal invariant, then you get something even larger. Yeah, that's correct. You could repeat it, but as the signature becomes like. You know, as, as it becomes like d co m comma n, it's a little bit unphysical, yeah. right? But this is these are statements about representation theory, right? Like you could, you know, that the projective representations are trickier, right? But uh, you just you can just like work with the universal coverings and construct all of them. So in principle, you know all the rules to describe or construct the representation theory conformal group in real. Uh, in, in Minkowski and uh, Euclid in Euclidean and Lorentzian signature, just based on you have already learned. We have not discussed it in detail, but it's very basically bars for a representation of Lorentz group or S O N. All right. So if a theory, an example is such theory, a theory that's symmetric under this is massless, uh, massless free fields, scalar fields. Right, uh, that that's one such example that remains quantum mechanically conformal invariant. We talked about actions that uh, satisfy uh, conformal symmetry at the level at the classical level. For example, Yang Mills and uh, equal four, but quantum mechanically the symmetry is not preserved. All right, so there are no other charges associated with, with this from the first part of the course, you remember the Poincaré charges are P mu and M mu nu. And then dilatation is the charge associated with scaling and K mu is a special conformal transformation charge. The conservation laws are written in terms of stress sensor. So uh, the conservation of the trans, uh, no, this was, yeah, this is translation invariance is basically satisfied by construction. If you recall the definition of stress sensor, 
then um, Lorentz invariance will tell you that the indices of uh, that stress tensor has to be symmetric, right? And uh, tracelessness is the condition for scale invariance. And we saw that if you have a symmetric stress tensor that is traceless, then automatically you also satisfy k mu dot equals to zero. So you automatic, that's why the special conformal transformations are included to enlarge the relativistic scale invariant theory group to the conformal group. All right. Um, Massive free fields are an example, I said. And then, you know, like the, the, there are these fields that transform canonically under the action of dilatation. So you could take a dilatation operator as a self adjoint operator. You'll, it has a positive spectrum. I haven't explained that to you guys, but it does have a positive spectrum. And then the spectrum will basically label all sorts of scaling operators. This is the route to come from quantum field theory that is smoothly connects to uh, critical phenomena in statistical physics. Anyway, any questions about this part? I said all of this to say that the modern understanding of quantum field theory will be a perturbation theory built around any conformal, free, uh, conformal field theory. So the example that we're going to pick and work with is going to be free massless fields. Those are conformal fields. And the conformal, the, the scaling dimensions are the power counting uh, thing that we have been discussing so far. All right. Then in the previous lecture, in the last lecture, we also, we, so we, we had a high level discussion of conformal transformations and then switch gears and talk about renormalized perturbation theory. So let me just re review that. Today, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to review what we did in renormalized perturbation theory for scalar field, repeat that for uh, QED, reproduce all the three, four lectures that we had to renormalize QED here in this language of renormalized perturbation theory and show you a pattern. I'll comment on Ward identities. They play the big role, right? When we're doing these uh, loop integrals, one loop integrals. And I think depending on how much time we have, I might or might not get to talking about higher loops, but that is the uh, plan for today. So uh, in renormalized perturbation theory, the starting point is you have the Lagrangian with bare couplings and bare fields, right? So this is where all the couple, I'm, I'm putting a zero to uh, define to as just a label, right? Phi naught and uh, couplings, uh, generically, I can call them G naughts, right? First, I define a renormalized field using some scaling parameters Z. Then I take my Lagrangian, write it only in terms of the renormalized Lagrangian. So this is the same Lagrangian with the renormalized field and renormalized couplings. Whatever is left over, I'm going to call the camera curves. Right? So all the infinities are going to be in here and in here, and hopefully LR is fine. That would be the ideal. So then after we did, we do this, Previously, we forgot when we we're not doing renormalized perturbation theory, we would take this and uh, take L0 and set up Feynman perturbation theory in terms of phi naught. And we found all sorts of divergences. Here, what we do is we take this action, which is now renormalized perturbation theory, renormalize uh, Lagrangian plus counter terms, and construct Feynman perturbation theory for phi of R, renormalized fields. And these are viewed as some sort of a Funky interaction counter terms or some interaction terms that are precisely constructed in such a way to render L of R finite of the quantum, the, sorry, to render your, your correlation functions and, or, or amplitudes finite. We'll have to set, decide on renormalization conditions. Renormalization conditions are precisely the rules that tell you how the infinity is actually pushed into these counter terms. We'll see that in a second. All right, so an example is phi four, four theory. So in phi four theory, I define the same way that I described phi r is uh, phi zero is z to the power of half phi r. So this is my kinetic term. This is my, um, this is my, uh, the, the mass term, right? And then this is the interaction term. Now we define these, 
counter terms this way, these parameters. And here in the first line, this is just like trivial algebra. This is what I called L of R, right? And in the bottom, this, this line, uh, these are the counter terms, right? So now define, because we are doing perturbation theory in terms of these renormalized fields, here are the uh, propagator and uh, the interaction term, the vertex, the, uh, vertex, interaction vertex for renormalized field. So the normalized field that here, I'm gonna put MR squared because that's supposedly what the mass is, right? And now here I'm gonna put lambda of R, right? But now I have these new interactions due to counter terms. So I'm gonna put include the counter terms and the simple laws of uh, rules that we learned for inverting matrices and we're doing path integrals tell you that these are the uh, correct um, expressions in Legos of Feynman diagrams. Good, any questions? All right, so now we need to understand the normalization conditions. The normalization conditions, whoops, I changed convention, tells you this, that if you have a two-point function propagator of the renormalized fields, then it should have a pole at a point which is a renormalized mass, right? There could be all sorts of fine terms. We don't care about that. We discussed this uh, in part one of the course that Due to interaction, the effective interaction is to renormalize the mass, and that's understood as the pole on the real axis, right? For uh, for well, the pole of this expression of the propagator, right? So this is we, we're gonna this is this is one of our uh, renormalization conditions. Now it's two conditions. We saw this before. How do we see that? Well. First, this is the condition that the uh, pole is at mR squared. The other one is that the residue of the pole is one, right? So let's renormalize at one loop. Of course, I can try to satisfy this equation at arbitrary loop. That will be renormalizing at some arbitrary loop. But for simplicity, we're gonna renormalize our theory at one loop, which means that take this guy, well, this is a, take this guy and write it in this way. Right now, this m squared of p squared is something that I have to calculate. It's a one pi. It's related to one pi, right? Uh, one particle reducible diagrams, and it has two contributions at one loop. There is this, the loop divergence, that that's loop divergent, and then there is a, a term coming from the counter term, right? So if we want this to so if one of it's obvious that at one loop, this guy at p squared, uh, at this this term should vanish if the expression, the pole of this expression is supposed to be i over p squared minus m r squared. This m squared should vanish, which means that if there is an infinity in here, it should cancel exactly by this, right? So here's here are the relations. So m p squared that p squared equal m r squared is equal to zero tells you that the location of the pole is where it's supposed to be. Residue of the pole being one is the statement that, that d, d, d m p squared uh, d p squared at this energy scale is zero. This is the energy scale where you renormalize in your theory. I'll comment on that later. Good. So if these are divergent terms, both of them are divergent, how do we keep track of it? Well, this divergence is invented precisely such that it cancels this. The arbitrariness of this divergence is in the coupling here, right? Delta Z and Delta M are to be determined using uh, renormalization conditions, good? Such that they precisely cancel the divergences in here. So, well, what we did we, in the previous part of the course was we used dim reg, and every time you do dim reg, you uh, have to introduce the scale, right, mu. This renormalization scale is, this mu is not to be confused with the renormalization scale, right? Renormalization scale is set by the energy scale of external legs. For example, in this case, we're saying p squared equal mr squared, right? That's the, that's the scale that we're renormalizing at. This mu actually goes for the right. The mu, mu is some arbitrary parameter we've introduced in our normalization. And this term is, if this is mu dependent in dim reg, this term has the precisely this correct 
Well, the opposite new dependence, so they cancel, right? So we 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 saw this before in the previous lecture that uh, if you do this, basically the two parameters that you have introduced. So, so what were the parameters? There was delta z, delta m, delta lambda. Delta z and delta m are going to be fixed. Delta z is zero at one loop. Delta m is takes the following form. Good. And the normalization condition, in a sense, is the statement that bare couplings are independent of mu. Right? It should be. It, it makes sense. Now, if you want to normalize the coupling, the four-point function, you do the same thing. You take the four-point function of phi r's, and the amputated diagram, you're going to set this to be minus i delta of r, lambda of r. And you have to decide uh, at what value of uh, Mandelstam variables you want to calculate the one loop contributions. We're going to set that to be s equal 4mr squared. If you recall, Mandelstam variables are just the total center mass energy. Right? That, that's why we're picking this to be 4mr squared. So at one loop, we saw that there is the good old vertex, and then there are these divergent terms. And then, of course, there is the counter term. Again, what we do is in dim reg, these divergences are regulated, and we're going to fix the coefficient of these, um, these z's and deltas that we introduced, the coefficients of the uh, counter terms, such that they cancel the divergences in dim reg. Good? So that's a, that's a prescription. And you see how it is generalized. Today, I'm going to walk you through doing this for QE. Any questions? All right, before switching to QED, I want to talk a little bit about um, word identities. So, um, because it's, it's, an, it's an important concept. If you have a theory that has symmetries, we already saw that because of symmetries, the naive dimension counting arguments might fail to give you the right picture of the divergence, how badly a diagram is divergent, or how badly a, a, uh, uh, some, yeah. And that had to do with two phenomena. One phenomenon was that sometimes due to symmetry, the coefficient of the worst divergent term was zero. It was set to zero due to symmetry, right? It was forbidden. This was the case in the uh, vacuum polarization QED, right? So the vacuum polarization was, had this offensive lambda squared term, but that violates gauge invariance, so it wasn't there. Another way for, that they, they could be misleading is that when you have sub diagrams. So we're, we're going to get to that. Well, when you have a, a diagram, which inside it, there's a Feynman diagram, which inside it has other divergences. That's we're going to discuss actually in two loop exam, in the two loop exam. But what, in, a, in the case of a gauge theory, uh, in the case of QED, we saw that this principle, the symmetry, or, Sorry, not symmetry, but the principle, the constraint that was messing our dimensional counting was ward identities, right? So let's just go very quickly over what ward identities are. If I want to do a one-liner, ward identities are quantum conservation laws. So what is a conservation law? No other current, right? It's conserved. So del mu j mu is equal to zero. That's a classical statement. On the shell, that's true. The quantum version of that is called a ward identity. Now, let's step, let's take a few steps back and compare this to something else I described called Schrodinger Dyson equations in the previous lecture uh, course. We know that classically, del s del phi is equal to zero. These are the equations of motion, right? However, quantum mechanically, the equations of motion do not hold as an operator equation. What we saw is that Schrodinger Dyson are the closest thing we could get to quantum equations of motion. And what they tell you is that if you take del s del phi x and put it next to a whole bunch of other operating exertions, time order it, this thing is zero up to contact terms. And contact terms are when this x meets each of these insertions. These were the, these were the, 
showing your Dyson equation. And if you call, we used it to relate higher point functions to lower point functions. And we said formally, you could just formulate the whole quantum field here in terms of showing your Dyson equation, just very, very formally and non-perturbatively. But it's, it's a useless <laughs> uh, framework. Well, I shouldn't say that strongly. In some very, very nice theories, you could actually use it. All right. So now the same way that here you had an equation that was classically zero, but put inside matrix elements of all sorts of operators, it was given contact terms in quantum mechanics. Word identities have the exact same flavor. We know that del mu j mu is equal to zero classically, but what is del mu expectation value of time order j mu a whole bunch of other operations? Ward identities tell you that this is a bunch of parameters. This is what ward identities are. Good. So let's just pause and let this thing sink. <laughs> Any questions? I will derive ward identities in QED for you. Uh, like that's my next point. But I just want to understand you to understand the high level picture. So del mu j mu of x, its expectation value is zero, and its expectation value next to all the other operations is zero as long as x and other points don't overlap. The moment they overlap, they're counter terms, and they're decided by the symmetry by the word identities. They're contact terms. Is it what camera said? Contact terms. They're contact terms. So for example, one of the things that's nice here is that what's an example of a, uh, uh, like, well, Take a charge in quantum field theory. For instance, what? Hamiltonian. Or take P mu, right? That is conserved. So, but that doesn't mean that that operator is equal to zero, right? Put it inside some expectation value, some, some uh, time-ordered correlator. You could calculate what that correlation function is using more data, right? Because if you recall, T mu nu was actually the, uh, no, they're current for uh, Lorentz transformation, corresponding to Lorentz transformations. All right. So let's derive the word identity in case of QED. Or by, by QED, I mean just a, 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 a fermion field coupled to charge under some um, gauge group. So consider, let's say this is your fermion, and then this is some uh, current, JMU electromagnetic current, consider the three-point function like this, psi, psi bar, hopefully you recall what psi bar is, x1, x2, j mu. So this is the matrix elements of interest. We want to tell the, take del del mu of this, right? And the result should be a whole bunch of contactors. Okay, so first thing is for you guys to recall a little bit what a derivative was, take the definition, recall the definition of a derivative, Recall the definition of time ordering. So you just have to write this as x plus epsilon minus the same thing, epsilon. And you have to worry about time ordering of x plus epsilon and this x versus x1, x2. When you write that and you, you work it out algebraically, you, you learn that there are three terms that contribute to this. Well, the first term is the naive term when del, del mu comes in. And the two other terms are correspond to Dirac delta function when x and x1 or x and x2 sit on top of each other. This just comes from uh, writing down the definition of what the uh, limit the derivative is and time order, right? So I yeah, absolutely encourage you guys to work this out at home. Then what you get, the, extra, the two extra terms that you get is a commutator of j0 and psi x1 and the other term is j0 and psi x2. Why j0? Can you just quickly guess? It has to do with time order, right? Well, you'll, you'll just write this as a straightforward 
It's a straightforward algebra. All right, but what is the commutator of J0 and X1? If I take this and integrate it over X, if I integrate J0 over X, what do I obtain? Charge operator, right? The commutator of a charge operator, Q, and a, an operator, Psi, a fermion that's charged on there is just a charge of the fermion. But now, because it's a local thing, I know that this commutator is minus the charge of the fermion, psi of x1, Dirac delta function, right? Because when this is space-like separated from this, they're just going to meet. Similarly for the psi bar, but with the opposite charge. So putting this together, we learned that the three-point function taking the derivative of the uh, j mu next to psi, psi bar will give you two contact terms. One of them is uh, minus q two-point function. The other one is plus q two-point function. As I promised, similar to showing your uh, showing, showing a Dyson equation, it relates higher-point function to contact terms that involve lower-point functions. So two-point function in this step. case. But now, this is a, something that has to do with QED. This is a three-point function. These are two-point functions, so let's Fourier transform them. Here's a three-point non-perturbative vertex. Nowhere in this discussion of ward identities, up to here, I said anything about perturbation theory, right? And this three-point function is not amputated, so it have, have the SP2, right? So it's, it's like this, it's like P1, P2, and there is this sigma, right? So SP2 is the fermion propagator for this part. SP1 is the fermion propagator for this one. And this is the vertex, right? The derivative will give you Q mu. Q is, sorry, Q is this guy. This is the left-hand side of uh, word identities, right? The right-hand side is I S minus one P one, uh, sorry, minus Q S P two plus I Q S P one. You could just get rid of these S one S P two on the left-hand side and write Ward Takahashi identity this way as a formal inverse of the uh, fermion propagator. This is a non-perturbative equation. I cannot stress this enough. Meaning what? Meaning that if, and what does it say? It relates the three-point function vertex to arbitrary loop renormalize whatever it is. I don't care how many loops you go to renormalize this, to, to renormalize this. Or and it relates the three-point function vertex to the two-point function. So it it relates the mass renormalization of electron to the vertex renormalization. This is why I'm going through this. So it's this. When we said that, when we're, we're going to see in a second, when we do renormal perturbation theory for QED, we're going to have the renormalization of the fermion mass. We're going to have a renormalization of the wave function of the uh, photon and the vertex renormalization. And we're going to see the vertex renormalization is related, actually given precisely, is fixed in terms of the fermion renormalization, Alawar Takashi identity. We're going to see that explicitly, but this is a principle that it should hold to arbitrary order in perturbation theory and beyond, non-perturbative. But it's one of the non-perturbative, few non-perturbative results in quantum field theory we could rely on. So to demystify this, let's just think about this at tree level, right? That most trivial thing possible. So in this case, this is just gamma mu, right? And these propagators are P, P1 slash minus M minus P2 slash minus M. You'll learn that Q mu is P1 mu minus P2 mu. That is just conservation of momentum. So good, we're not talking nonsense. And we're gonna do their one loop calculation in a bit. Well, comes out of the one loop normalized perturbation theory of QED that this actually holds. But it's not surprising because we just proved it. There's a whole section of Peskin, which is about how symmetry and renormalization perturbation Renormalized perturbation theory in track, you're related. Well, sorry, renormal symmetries. If you have symmetries, you have to use that intelligently to, it will teach you non-perturbative statements or a whole bunch of statements about your renormalized perturbation theory. 
divergences might be related to each other. This war Takahashi identity is very, very general. We often formulate this in a more compact way. And that is the case of taking this and taking the soft limit, soft photon limit, where, where the photon that we were propagating that was propagating, right, is very low momentum. In this limit, Q goes to zero. And well, this is given by the derivative of the inverse of the propagator. Right? Why is that? Because this is P, P2 is P1 plus Q. Right? When it's small, you just expand in Taylor series and get a Q mu that cancels this out, and you get this. This is the word identity. Uh, the the vertex of non-perturbative vertex operator is zero PP is uh, gamma mu minus this. This comes from the fact that I just wrote it in terms of the self-energy. Right? The self-energy, I just have a software. Let's say I have a non-perturbative definition of it. So, good. So in renormalized perturbation theory, I repeat, in QED, word identities relate the vertex renormalization, three-point function, J psi psi bar, to the fermion wave function renormalization, the two-point function of psi psi bar. The divergences that appear in here and in here are related. And in fact, you, you will see that explicitly. Any questions? I'm going too fast. All right, so let's renormalize, re-renormalize QED. As we said, the starting point, so you're gonna see, I'm gonna play this trick that seems redundant at first. Um, I'm gonna start with, the starting point is to define, so I have two fields, right? The fermion field psi naught, which is the bare field, and then the gauge field, the bare gauge field A0. And I'm gonna define the renormalized gauge field and the renormalized uh, psi of psi. This bit is called the wave function normalization, right? Just a wave function normalization. Do you know why? Well, you can, you can guess it, right? We saw that as an operator, when psi acts on the vacuum of the Fox space, it creates a one particle wave function. Therefore, if you rescale that, that's a wave function normalization. All right, so the bare Lagrangian, after a little bit of algebra written in terms of the normalized piece plus the counter terms, which is whatever leftover divergences, could be written in the following intelligent form. So this this looks like the um, kinetic term for the gauge fields, right? The coefficient of it is delta three, and delta three is just z three minus one, right? It's just the uh, normalization of the gauge field. Then there are two terms that are so there is the normalization of the mass of the fermion. Z2 plays a role here, right? And then there is a renormalization of the wave function of the fermion. Delta 2 plays a role here. Now, I've done something a little bit funky. I've introduced delta 1 gr. Delta 1 is Z1 minus 1. So if you ask me what is Z1, this is the definition I've used. G renormalized Z1 is G0, Z3, half z2. I absolutely recommend that you guys go through this. So do it at home. That's a two liner. I just didn't want to walk you through like a few lines of addition and subtractions. But you'll see the point of defining z1. All right. With this, well, now we have your, your bare action. And we're going to do perturbation theory in terms of renormalized variables. So you on top of the on top of your good old uh, Feynman. <laughs> what are they called? The pieces of the Lego pieces of the Feynman diagram Legos. You have these new counterterm interactions. You have the counterterm for the propagator of the photon, which is well, this is expected, right? By just uh, by by gauge invariance, right? Do you recall why? Why is this related to gauge invariance? 
Because a massless spin, uh, massless uh, spin one field cannot have a degree of freedom along the direction of its propagation. This is a projection, so that that kills that projection to perpendicular thing. We saw that we repeat that many times. So the counter term should also be like that, right? Because it has to respect the symmetries. There is a counter term for the fermion, right? Whoops. And then there's a vertex counter term. All right, so with this perturbation theory, let's go through uh, the three diagram, normalization of the three diagrams we have. What were they? There were vacuum polarization. There was the vacuum polarization was the normalization of the uh, photon propagator. There was the fermion self energy, right? Mass of fermion self energy. And the third was, was the vertex, right? So we're going to go through that real quickly. Actually, is this clear? Is this principle clear? In principle, now you should know, know exactly. I just write some crazy looking, I give you a crazy looking Lagrangian. You first have to determine, is it power counting renormalizable? Is it power counting, is it not renormalizable or what? Right, how do you do that? The quickest way to do that is what? Mass dimensions of what has to be what? You look at the mass dimensions of your couplings and you re recall that depending on the dimension, they could be relevant, irrelevant, or marginal, right? So if there are if there is an irrelevant term in the Hamiltonian, that is bad, right? Give me an example of the simplest uh, relevant term you know. Awesome. You know a do you know a, a marginal term? The lambda and the phi four theory. Lambda phi four theory correct is a marginal term, but in general, in any quantum field theory, stress tensor is a, a marginal term because it has dimension d. It has it's an operate deformation. It has to be an operator of dimension d, right? Okay. All right, vacuum polarization. Photon propagator, we said that the full propagator could be written as a as one over one minus uh, one pi, right? And the one pi is the thing that we call this pi mu in your cube. Of course, it has to satisfy gauge invariance, so you pull this form out. And this is pi of q squared is the thing that we need to calculate. But then the vertex is this term, right? You just have to add that to it. This term should also have this piece in it, right? So what we learn is that, that we're adding these two terms and the, the, these two, the addition of these two, I'm just gonna call the renormalized pi. Now, what are my renormalization conditions? My renormalization condition is that pi of r of q squared is zero. What does that tell you about my photon propagator? it tells you that the photon propagator of the renormalized gauge field is just one over Q squared as it should be with the correct part projected, right? And delta three is equal to pi zero. Now we did this integral. And if you recall, we did dim reg, we did Feynman parameter tricks and uh, we, wrote it in terms of, we wrote it this way. This was the result of the integral. And we expanded this in small epsilon. Actually, have I done this? Yeah, I, I do it here. So this is the expression you find. In terms of the renormalized alpha of R, recall what alpha of R was? What is alpha? Uh, squared. Over four pi. Yeah, If every time you forget what alpha is, remember the Coulomb potential. It's alpha over R. Right, e squared over four pi. So it's e squared over four pi. That's al alpha squared, right? Um, that's alpha, yeah, over two pi. And as we said in dim reg, it comes at the cost of introducing mass scale mu squared. So here is mu squared, right? And you tune your delta three to cancel this guy out. Therefore, it will depend on mu squared. And of course, you have factors of epsilon. You, we, we said that there is this MS bar prescription where we expand in terms of uh, in one in small epsilon and it's conventional to define 
epsilon bar, and that's called MS bar scheme, where you just take out this half ln of 4 pi e to minus gamma. I forget what gamma was called, Euler constant, or some, something like Euler. And of course, Euler did everything, right? And it comes from the expansion of the gamma function. All right. So this is the principle. All that we did could be summarized just in terms of this. You're just following your notes, right? Like you're just writing down. But hopefully the role of the normalization conditions is clear. Remember that when in this step, when we are renormalizing the theory, you're not calculating anything. Once you renormalize the theory, now the next calculations are going to be genuine calculations. This is calibrate calibration of the theory, right? This, in a sense, you go, you, you look at the propagator of the photon at some energy scale or mass of your particle on some energy scale, right? You're doing running some experiment at, so let's say LIC at center mass energy something is telling you that the mass of the particle is something, right? You use that to renormalize your theory. Now that you know renormalize your theory, you can go and calculate arbitrary afterwards, right? All right. So a uh, renormalizable theory is a theory where you can get rid of all the infinities by introducing a finite number of these variables, right? So you could actually calibrate this because it takes a finite number of measurements. Yeah. But there, there's a finite number of divergences that you could just get rid of. Divergent amplitudes, right? So I guess non renormalizable theory is when We've already fixed all like all in there, then that we have available and we still find divergences. Yeah. So those theories are sensible at the level of effective action, effective field theory. We're are we gonna discuss that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, if you're trying to like test if your theory is renormalizable, like and and you have to add like more terms at what like at what point you know you've like done enough at all of you. So Usually, so take your potential and expand it. Re recall that we expanded the potential in derivatives and powers of the field. Taylor expand the potential. As you go to higher orders and higher derivatives, it gets worse and worse. So, so the adding extra terms usually doesn't save you, right? If you have a theory that on the surf on the face of it, face value of it, the very Lagrangian seem to include stuff that are non-renormalizable, but I think, I, I'm not saying there's no magic. There are, there's magic in the world, but not always, right? Like you can't, there might be some funky resummation, blah, 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 but in in principle, that's not uh, something that can solve your problem, right? So if, yeah. The relevant operator, if in dimension counting, the thing that's interesting is this. So this is the sense in which quantum field theory is a lot more restrictive than quantum mechanics because of its symmetries. We discussed this in the past, right? So we said how Lagrangian, how locality and Lorentz invariance restricts you. Here is the principle of renormalization that puts an extra constraint. If, I, if I'm describing the Hamiltonian of a quantum mechanical system, any term goes, right? Any term that's self adjoint and, and is bounded, keeps the whole thing bounded below is allowed. In quantum field theory, if you, it is to make sense as a full UV theory, there are only a few number of terms that you can rely on. Those are the relevant terms, and there isn't much else. Yeah. So here we're fixing the our constant, the, the, our like finite number of constants at one at the one loop level. Yeah. So if you go go to higher loops, mm -hmm. uh, will we get uh, more constants in this case or? Um, or if it takes it at one loop, everything else falls out. Now, we'll, we'll see an example of this. That, well, what happens is that these deltas that I'm defining, these Zs and deltas, will also have a loop expansion. So there will be a contribution. You could take delta 3 and say there is an alpha squared term, there is an alpha cube term, alpha 4 term, and so on and so forth. Right? You could view them as new terms but they're just like perturbative expansion. It's the number of infinities, it's like a function worth of infinity, right?
Yeah, at each loop, these functions are become more and more elaborate. Wait, so if you want to confirm that uh, the theory is fully like, it's just normally to arbitrary order, you have to like, mathematically, painstakingly calculate everything. Luckily, luckily, there are formal proofs. Yeah. So there is this thing, theorem that I will quote, we will not discuss it at all. It's pretty advanced, but it tells you that for a renormalizable theory, you could make all the Feynman, uh, all the um, amplitudes finite with a finite number of local counter terms. The keyword here is local. And that, that's a theorem that you could prove, people have proven. It's very fancy. We're just gonna give one example of a two loop calculation and see some subtleties that arise. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just go if I want to find these deltas at one loop, technically any one loop calculation of an actual scattering amplitude is fine. Oh, point. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But then if we try to go to two loops, we need to do two two loop normalization. Correct. Correct. But they're all yeah. You see, like, yeah, this is, yeah, this gives you a one loop endpoint function, right? You you just decide, you you fix that you normalize the uh, one, uh, well, this is one loop, just renormalizes the vertex, two point function and two point function, right? Propagator and the three point function. And that gives you the endpoint function of one loop. Similarly, at higher loops, whatever you normalize, it will give you all the hard points. And, and these deltas are, are uh, like incoming energy independent, right? Which is how you get to. No, it's in, they do depend on the incoming energy. Here I chose to, so incoming energy is not new. I'll comment on that, right? I chose to renormalize in a very particular way. I wanted the interpretation. I'll, I'll say that in a second, actually. I'll say that in a second. Yeah, no, I was just making particular choices. But of course you could renormalize. If I'm, if I'm an experimentalist dealing with 14 TeV center of mass uh, collisions at uh, LHC, I'm not going to renormalize the zero momentum, right? I'm just going to renormalize the depth scale because I'm dealing with those scale calculations, right? Make sense? Okay, fermion self energy. So the fermion self energy, if you recall this I of SF, the one PI thing is this, right? And it has two contributions the contribution coming from this diagram. Right, and then there's a counter term. So I'm going to go through this really fast. The renormalization of the condition is that the uh, one pi thing, this guy, has to be zero when the external legs are at mr, so that the propagator, the hole, is not shifted. Right, the mass of the fermion is not shifted, and then the residue is equal to one, which means that the wave function is properly normalized. Right. So uh, we calculated this in uh, dim reg, right? And the result at one loop, which means alpha r or level order alpha r, was alpha r mr over four pi, this gamma of these gamma functions, of course, it depends on mu squared and this term. And then I have this, this guy, which is delta of m. I add them and the requirement that this is zero at p equal mr tells you that delta m is minus this term. Right, and then I have to take a derivative with respect to p. Oh no, sorry, that's incorrect. P squared, I think. Um, I think it's p squared. Maybe it's p. I don't remember. <laughs> no, I think I think it's p. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair amount. It's p slash. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so this is the first condition, and then the uh, residue condition is you just take this expression. You this was the full integral before I do any. Uh, approximation, right? You take the derivatives and you obtain that the requirement that you cancel, uh, you that the residue is properly normalized, residue is one, is that delta two is this expression, which is proportional to arc C gauge, the C of arc C gauge, right? Recall what the arc C gauge was. Okay, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> it was gauge, yeah. Sorry? Okay. All right, so hopefully by now the principle is clear. I'm going to comment on the vertex correction, but here is a good place to actually, what we just learned about is a check to see uh, word identities that work at one loop. Because the word identities that work at one loop will relate 
the renormalization of vertex to renormalization of the fermion property. Right? All right. So fermion is delta 2 and delta n. Right? In particular, the one that's going to appear is delta 2. But we'll see. All right. So here's the condition I should have, renormalization condition. This is, again, a very soft photon. Right? So we saw in uh, in the calculation of one loop, I'm not going to repeat it, that this is the form of the divergence. Let me just draw it very quickly. This was the diagram we calculated, right? And then I have this term, right? So this is this term. And then this is this term. We calculate that in dim reg. And the condition of the cancellation condition is delta 1 is this. But now you see delta 1 and delta 2 are equal. This is sanity check. Ward identities hold. And if you want to know how exactly is this ward identities, just write down ward identities and expand it. You will see that explicitly. Good. All right. Another way of saying that is that Z1 is equal to Z2. Right? Now recall my definitions. I think I defined the things this way was, uh, oh my God, Z3, Z2, G0. Yeah, this was my definitions I used. Now we just learned that because of word identity, Z1 and Z2 are the same. Therefore, GR is Z3 half G0. Recall what G3, Z3 was, it was the renormalization of A, I believe, right? Or Psi, yeah. A or Psi, which one? A. Okay, so it's a normalization of A. So it's, it's... all right, <laughs> if you say so. All right, so good. So that brings us all the way up to here. The next comment is about the question that you were asking earlier. So here I chose my normalization condition at a very, very special scale. I was always saying that the external legs are at MR squared. Why was I doing that? Because I wanted to get the good old propagators right? The pull of the propagator is the only thing that I cared about, right? I knew that I wanted this to look like one over P squared minus MR squared plus junk. Junk is finite. That's the only thing I care about, right? So then I was sitting at P squared minus M, uh, MR squared. But in principle, you can renormalize your theory at arbitrary scale. If Q squared or P squared are the external legs, just renormalize at some, some scale. I should, maybe I shouldn't call this mu squared, but it's, it's conventional to call it mu squared. Some, some other energy scale, right? For example, I give the example of the center mass energy at LXC, right? You normalize at that scale, and then you do a higher point calculations at that scale. All sorts of scattering processes. Any questions? How do you find a renormalization condition that obviously? So you set your renormalization condition. So you see what you have to do an experiment at certain energy and read off the mass, MR squared. That will fix for you, right? These Z's and stuff. Now that you did this calculation, you can go ahead and calculate. Now you're you might be asking a different question. You're asking that you renormalize the theory at this scale. Can you relate that to the theory you normalize at a lower scale? The answer is going to be the running of couplings. That's going to be renormalization group flow. Because otherwise, you have no predictions. How you have some? It's less predictive. Well, higher point functions, low energy processes, higher point functions. Yeah, I mean, well, if you every amplitude required an observable measuring something. Yeah, like every single energy you did required a, you to measure something at that energy already. That's so called that, a non-renormalizable yeah, theory. Yeah, yeah. And even <laughs> non-renormalizable theories could be used as EFTs. So now that we could also discuss. But that's what the non-renormalizable theory is, right? Any other questions? All right, so in the remaining couple of minutes, I'm going to actually, I, I, it's a good moment to pause and ask questions because my next comments are going to be about renormalization at 
par loops, in particular two loops. I'll make just some broad comments. It's a, it's a big thing, and I don't, I'm not an expert on this either. But next lecture, we're going to include the calculation of two loop of five four theory to just see some of the subtleties that come up at higher loops. And, and, but I'm going to discuss them at high level right now. Any questions about one loop renormal renormalized perturbation theory, the philosophy of it, how it's done, uh, the physics of it, the meaning of these words, renormalization conditions, scale, renormalization scale. Any questions about this? Because it's a very, very important that you get you nail this conceptually. Any QFT calculation, perturbative QFT calculation requires renormalized perturbation. All right. Okay. Normalization of higher loops. So let's just draw a whole bunch of higher loop diagrams, right? This is an example. Now, the first thing you notice is that as you go to higher loops, you could have sub diagrams that are divergent. Right? This is a photon. This is vacuum polarization. So you will have to add a counter term like this. Right? This counter term is divergent, but then there is this, there could be divergences due to the loop. So it's kind of confusing. That if if you were if you were doing uh, divergences, uh, you were doing calculation of divergences, how they uh, grow with powers of lambda. Let's forget about Dimbrek for a second. It seems like you can get all sorts of things. You can get the previously we were saying that parallel divergences you use normalization conditions to get rid of. Then there are the log divergences, right? And they were important and physical, and we work with them, and they're gonna be related to running of the couplings. Now, here it seems like there's also there are a whole bunch of parallel divergences, and there could be all sorts of non-parallel things. For example, log of lambda to some power, log of lambda, the whole thing to some power. Right. So what is the principle? We know that this principle that we discussed, I, I, we went through this uh, in the last lecture very briefly, but requirement that by adding local counter terms, you could make everything finite. That is a consequence of the fact that we argued for that at one loop, or I just said it in words, that the, all the divergences have the structure of a polynomial in external momenta. I did this by taking derivatives of external legs, right? But there is a formal proof that says local counter term can capture all divergences to all orders in perturbation theory and normalized perturbation theory. It's called BPHC theorem. So this is where the question you were asking is answered, right? We're not going to get into the that. But these are very simple diagrams. There are fancier two loop diagrams. Well, actually, this is the, another simple diagram. So consider this, this diagram, right? There is K1 and K2 that I'm integrating over. Now, K2 can go to infinity. There are divergences due to this that I'm going to try to actually get rid of using this diagram, right? But now I realize that there at two loop, there's another contribution that looks like this. This is the two loop diagram that contributes to the vacuum polarization, but in it, it contains the vertex renormalization. So we saw that the vertex renormalization goes like log of lambda squared, right? And this integral goes like pi two of q squared. So it looks like this diagram is going like pi two of q squared alpha log of lambda squared. So we're getting log of lambda squared times log of lambda squared. There are all sorts of funky divergences that you can get. And the require, so here you try to uh, get rid of this divergence by adding this counter term, right? And this counter term, which is an alpha squared contribution to the counter term that you, we could say that your delta, delta three has a term at order alpha squared. Right? So we'll see an explicit example of this construction in the next lecture. We're gonna see how, how these terms work, but I just want to use a cartoon picture. 
what I'm going to say is not literally true, right? But in a Fourier space, when you, the divergence has come from large momenta. Large momenta, roughly speaking, is where you cannot distinguish. So it's like a very, very short distance effect. It's like sort of not being able to resolve this step. Right? So if you have a one loop contribution to four point function, right? Something like this. And it's at very, very high energy, contribution very, very high energy. If you don't have high resolution in your detectors, this might look like some effective four point function. That is sort of the principle behind adding to this, this gamma term. And this principle holds it, uh, all, to all orders in perturbation theory. All right, so any questions? This is a very cryptic comment, but we'll see that when we get to effective field theory. So if I want to summarize uh, today's lecture, this is how it goes. We started, of course, in renormalized perturbation theory I'm discussing, I'm doing perturbation theory around a conformal fixed point, which is free massless fields. Very, very boring theory, right? We're doing that, setting up that perturbation theory. However, in principle, everything I've taught you could be generalized to any arbitrary CFD fixed point, and that's called conformal perturbation theory. That's like a formalism that's used. If we have another principle that classifies CFT conformal field theories for us, we have a generalized notion of what quantum field theory is, and that's a modern understanding of quantum field theory. We're not going to discuss that in this course a lot, but that's what the picture is. I'm just saying, in case you ever deal with um, conformal perturbation theory, this is what it is. It's not some sort of a, um, an exotic thing. So, that was the first comment. Then we started doing normalized perturbation theory. And the idea was very simple. You take your bare Lagrangian in terms of bare fields and bare couplings. You introduce wave function renormalization parameters for every single field in your Lagrangian, right? And using that, you, re you define renormalized fields and renormalized couplings. You split your Lagrangian into a renormalized term, renormalized Lagrangian, which is only renormalized fields and couplings, plus junk. The junk you call counterterms. Now, instead of your perturbation theory, Feynman diagrams, treating for phi r's, the, for renormalized fields, treating the counterterms as some formal interactions. They might be divergent, but who cares? We're just going to treat them as formal interactions, right? Then renormalization conditions is just the sanity check that when you set the propagator of your field phi of r, has a pole at m of r squared, the field phi of r has mass m of r, is that correct, right? That's just sanity check. To be able to interpret, you just call this parameter m of r. Is it the mass of the field phi of r? The renormalization condition tells you that yes, it is, right? And the, the wave function renormalization is precisely the same in that phi of r acting on the vacuum creates a single particle whose two-point function is the propagator. Right? These are these are just like sanity checks. And for every coupling, your Lagrangian, you will have to introduce one of these renormalized things. However, as you we might we'll probably discuss it in more detail, if you have symmetries, sometimes these renormalizations constants are fixed in terms of each other, they are related. One example of such principle was we saw was word identities. Word identities are quantum versions of uh, conservation laws. For example, in the case of uh, gauge fields, del mu j mu, current is conserved, del mu j mu is equal to zero. There is a quantum version of that, which is if you put del mu of a time order j mu correlation function with junk, other stuff, this will be zero as long as all the points, none of the points will meet. But when they meet, there are contact terms, delta function, direct delta function terms. Right, those are the word identities, and the same way their their, their philosophy is really showing your Dyson kind of things, right? Showing your Dyson was telling you that the equations of motion, 
as classical equation, there are the quantum version. This is like conservation loss. Um, yeah, and similar to uh, Schrodinger Dyson, it relates higher form function in terms of lower to lower point functions, right? Um, is there something else I wanted to say? Yeah, in the case of uh, QED, renormalized perturbation theory, it relates to a three point function, which is J psi psi, the vertex renormalization to the two point renormalization, which is propagator of psi. And this is a non perturbative statement. We saw that in the case of at three level, this was just conservation of momentum. At one loop, this was just, just checked it explicitly. This was correct. All right. Finally, we, uh, yeah, I think finally we commented on the fact that higher loops, uh, there are, there could be more non, more fine key divergences that are not of the form, uh, are of the form parallel. And the requirement that you could, can, you could renormalize the theory only using um, counter terms, local counter terms, right? Is this BPHZ theorem that assure, ensures that by including local counter terms, you could always cancel any non polynomial, uh, non parallel, non polynomial, sorry, non parallel, non polynomial divergence that occurs in any diagram, in any, any absolute, sorry. All right. Any questions? This is, yeah. So, uh, so from, from at least from what I understand, any all the calculations that you did for these uh, for QAE, you're not the QAE in the greater previous course. Yeah. There's no way to get around doing this calculation. You always have to do this calculation, and but we interpret those calculations in, in terms of the normalization theory. Correct. 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 Yeah. There's no there's no shortcut, right? There's no shortcut. But over there, it, it we're just like it seemed like we're well, yeah. The set of tricks that we're using are sort of universal. You know, Feynman parameter tricks are used the same way. But now you sort of see why you were doing those calculations, right? You want to like, I I don't know how to say it. Like at the end, we when we always got to this weird awkward place where we we're trying to discuss renormalization. Some quantity was shifted by an infinite amount. Right here, this is like systematically taking care of the, the like the interpretation, and then tells you that justifies go do those calculations. So those calculations were fine. There's no shortcut. Yes, unless for some reason the symmetries of the, your theory fix some things, then this happens. It's a huge, it's an active area of research. How to do? Uh, are there? smart, quick ways of using symmetries to constrain perturbation theory. Because the number of integrals you have to do as you go to a higher loops is just insane. The number of diagrams goes insanely fast. The number of integrals goes insanely fast. And there are all sorts of reasons to believe that perturbation theory done this way is silly. I'm not going to say stupid because I don't know better. All right. Any other questions? Not um, thank you guys. This is the end of this lecture.